Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips and to help you master the game of building wealth. And firstly, let me apologize for a little bit of a longer episode this week, but what I wanted to talk about was the property market, specifically you know, the impending or growing rental crisis, what property prices might do, how borrowing capacity links into that, and also to remind ourselves that long-term fundamentals look very, very strong. But really, over the last six years, it's been a pretty wild ride for property investors. I mean, if we cast our mind back in 2017 and 18, the banking regulator um, started to demand that the banks reduce the volume of interest-only loans that they provided, particularly to investors. The media jumped on the bandwagon and, and labelled this the interest-only cliff. Uh, and the idea was that as borrowers are forced to repay principal interest, uh, that's going to squeeze their cash flow significantly, cause a lot of financial distress and large or an increase in defaults was expected. Of course, that didn't happen. Then in 2018 and 19, you may recall Bill Shorten, the leader of the Labor Party at the time, uh, during the 2019 federal election campaign, uh, promised to ban negative gearing and increase capital gains tax, uh, which certainly unsettled uh, property investors and the property market, create a bit of volatility. Uh, now, of course, Bill was uh, a short price favourite to win, but of course he didn't end up winning that uh, election and uh, the ALP has now abandoned that uh, policy. I, I imagine most political parties uh, probably won't go near that policy anymore. Uh, and then, of course, the COVID years, 2020 and 2021, were very kind to property investors uh, with prices booming. Uh, unfortunately, really since the RBA started hiking rates in May last year, uh, prices have come back. And in fact, I was reading a, an article uh, in the paper last week to, that suggested in some locations, prices are actually now lower than what they were at pre-COVID levels. So, you know, so we've benefited from a little bit of growth and in some situations they've lost that growth. So certainly last year-ish or so uh, hasn't been uh, overly optimistic for property investors. So if we think about the last six years, it's been a pretty tumultuous time for uh, the property market. Uh, and as a result, we should probably expect or shouldn't be surprised when we see that reflected in prices and price growth. However, the, the commentary by the media typically is very short term and they might look at maybe last year or year and a bit um, and start drawing conclusions. We always need to sort of look wider than that, of course, you know, as anyone that's listening to this podcast would, would certainly know by now. Okay, so let's talk about the rental crisis then, which is really there's a massive shortage of rental properties in Australia at the moment. Uh, and Domain recorded, or reported I should say, that the national vacancy rate was a mere 0.8 of 1%. Uh, Perth, Adelaide and Hobart essentially reporting zero vacancy, or ostensibly zero vacancy. Even vacancy rates in Melbourne and Sydney uh, have fallen from 27 and 1.9% respectively uh, a year ago to only 1% today. So really vacancy rates are very, very low. Um, over calendar year 2022, uh, nationally, rents have risen about 20%. Now, of course, that was coming off a lower base, you know, due to the reductions, rental reductions and so forth that occurred during the uh, COVID years, we'll call them. Um, but the trend is that rents are rising uh, and it doesn't look like that trend's going to abate uh, anytime soon uh, just because there's a, a, a big shortage of rental properties. And I think we'll see uh, the media reporting more and more on this uh, so-called rental crisis. Um, what is causing the rental crisis? Well, uh, some commentators have suggested that tightening rental laws um, have dissuaded investors from the property market. Um, and one of the most attractive uh, elements of investing in property is the fact that you have control over the asset. You have control on who you rent it to. Um, what improvements or repairs that you make, you know, the best use of the asset, those sorts of things. Now, tighter rental laws, as the one, as like the ones that were rolled out in Victoria in early 2021, um, reduce an investor's control, and uh, that that tends to have negative impact on 
at least demand for uh, property investments. Now, whilst that's probably have likely to occur, that is, it's reduced the attractiveness to uh, to some, for some people. Uh, I, I don't think I think it's at the margin. You know, I don't. I think the tightening rental regulations around the country that have occurred. Uh, over the last couple of years, yeah, I think they will dampen demand for or demand from property investors, but only at the margin. So I don't think it's the uh, the the major cause of the current rental crisis. I think the rental crisis is really driven by supply demand, but mostly supply. That is, the supply of rental properties has reduced uh, over over the last six years uh, rather than increased. Firstly, uh, research firm PropTrack uh, estimates that 15% of vendors are typically investors. So 15% of the people that are currently selling properties on the market or that tend to sell properties on the market uh, tend to be investors. That proportion, however, increased uh, over the last couple of years during 2020 and 2021 when properties were booming. Uh, and investors represented 20 to 25% of uh, total vendors out there at the time. So clearly, over the last couple of years, investors have taken the opportunity to cash out whilst prices were high, whilst there's a lot of FOMO, all those sorts of things. Obviously, a whole bunch of investors thought, great, it's a great time to sell, which it was. Um, and as a result, if they went and sold those properties to own occupiers, then of course, that pool of uh, rental properties reduces. Also, when we have a look at lending statistics, uh, for the six years between 2017 and 2022, remember at the beginning of the podcast, I talked about all the things like banning um, negative gearing and tightening up lending restrictions, all that sort of stuff that happened during that period. Uh, well, between 2017 and 2022, 31% of all new loans were made for investment purposes. If you compare that to the previous 14 years when the data set began in 2002, it it was used to be 38%. So there's been about 20% fewer investors over the last six years, which is quite a a long period of time on average, of course, uh, that have entered into the market. So putting those two things together, you've got more people selling investment properties than usual during the COVID boom. Uh, and over the last uh, six years, probably because of all the the the, the government intervention uh, and regulator intervention, uh, you've had fewer investors being attracted to the market. And as a result, we've got uh, a, a smaller pool of rental properties uh, and also therefore increased demand because of population growth that is translated into a rental crisis. So, of course, we've got to think about then how do we solve or how does the government solve the rental crisis? And, of course, there's been a lot of commentary and and uh, proposals made by special interest groups and so forth. So I thought it was worth uh, at least sort of summarising them. So uh, one suggestion is to increase social housing. Now, of course, that's a political politically attractive proposal. But the truth is that most renters don't qualify, won't or won't qualify for social housing. So whilst it's a nice feel-good thing, I'm sure we need more social housing in Australia, if we're just talking about the average renter, um, increasing social housing isn't going to do anything to uh, to uh, deal with the current rental crisis. Um, there's been a proposal, I think, by the Greens uh, to talk about introducing greater regulation to prevent landlords from increasing rent, so rental caps or those sorts of things. Um, and now if they do that, 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 that will just cause a mass exodus of investors from the market, uh, which, which is exactly what happened in Ireland. And then what happens is it makes the rental crisis much, much worse rather than better. You, you want to do the reverse. We want to be encouraging more investors into the market rather than fewer. Um, and it has been also suggested that build to rent could be a way to increase rental supply. So build to rent properties are, are typically sort of high density buildings that are owned by institutions for the sole purpose of renting them out longer term, not for you know developing and sale as, as a lot of developers might do today. Um, firstly, there's not enough build to rent construction currently going on in Australia to make any meaningful impact. Uh, to the rental crisis, which is not to suggest we shouldn't encourage more, but there's not. 
Secondly, an uh, evaluation firm called Charterkett Kramer put some research together that um, highlighted that the rents were 19 to 27% higher in build-to-rent properties compared to privately owned properties. And that makes sense because, you know, you need to develop the property and then you've got to generate some income off it. Uh, so, of course, there's going to be greater pressure on increasing rents. So the build-to-rent sector certainly could uh, help us longer term, um, but isn't really a, an obvious fix at this stage. Unfortunately, the only way to, in, uh, to fix the rental crisis is to increase the number of uh, rental properties. Now, you can go and go out and build a whole bunch of rental properties, but that's only going to be centred in some geographical location, so that's not really going to work. Uh, what you need is more established properties becoming rental properties. Uh, and to achieve that, what you need is more property investors, private property investors, to participate in the market. Now, the problem at the moment is borrowing capacity and interest rates. You know, obviously, interest rates have increased significantly. Look, as investors, long-term investors, we know if we're going to own a property for 30 years, interest rates are going to change over time. That's no big deal. That's not going to really worry people or stop people from entering into the market, but borrowing capacity will. Uh, and there's a chart that I shared, of course, links in the show notes, that um, CBA put together in their recent profit announcement that shows that borrowing capacity has has significantly reduced. And the reason it's significantly reduced is the regulator is adding or, or asking the banks to add a 3% interest rate buffer. That means that if you go and apply for an investment loan, uh, your repayments are getting tested at an interest rate of 8.7%. Uh, over a 25-year period on a principal interest basis. That means that if you want to go and borrow a million dollars, you've got to prove to the bank that you can afford to repay $94,000 a year. Now, it it only gets worse because obviously the RBA hasn't stopped hiking. At least that's what the market consensus is. The consensus is maybe there's two, possibly three more rate hikes. So in a relatively short period of time, Uh, Banks will be testing uh, investment loans at 9.5%, which I think anyone today would agree that is ridiculous, particularly if you're going to do it on a principal and interest basis. So at the moment, the way they're testing um, repayments, as I said, $94,000 for a million dollar loan. The actual repayments based on sort of current variable rates is about fifty six. dollars So they're doubling the actual repayments to make sure that borrowers can afford it at what looks to be close to the top of the interest rate cycle. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. The only way that, or the the biggest thing that's going to attract more property investors into the market is by giving them access to credit uh, and eventually dealing with that uh, that 3% buffer. Now we can debate whether um, the regulators should do that, whether they should loosen credit policy you know, um, how we could talk about how households are already have high indebtedness, uh, particularly with respect to property investing and so forth. We can have those conversations, but the reality is that the government will need to solve this rental crisis. Uh, it will get a lot worse before they actually do solve it. And the government will need to recognise that the only way to solve it is by letting more investors into the market. So if we're sitting here today thinking about property as an investment, we have to realise that there's a high likelihood that there's a potential tsunami of uh, property investors that are going to want to enter the market or going to be encouraged to enter the market um, sometime in the next six to 18 months. Let's just sort of, you know, I know that's a, that's a, a large sort of range, but it's going to happen. Like It's got to happen, really. Uh, because otherwise, you know, the, the Labor Party is going to have really blood on their hands by not acting to uh, resolve the rental crisis uh, sooner than they could. And remember, most renters are, are you know, weaker from an economic perspective, so they at least can afford both the rental crisis and also the cost of living crisis all at the same time. So many crises to keep tab of. So they do need to solve it. So if we're sitting here today thinking about property investment, we know that there's a big force of demand that's that's most likely going to enter into the market at some point, and that's always going to push prices higher. Uh, So it really is a kind of a good opportunity today. But I'm I'm not interested really in highlighting short-term 
um, uh, short-term changes or opportunities. I'm not here to sort of say now's the great time to buy a property. I don't think there's ever really a, a bad time or a or a good time if you're a long-term investor. But if we do look at the long-term fundamentals, you know that they, they are very very strong. We've got higher rental yields, and higher rental yields will attract more investors into the market. Sure, sure borrowing capacity is a challenge, but for those where borrowing capacity isn't a challenge, uh, higher rents will attract. Uh, more renters into the market. Uh, if we look at sort of the supply of housing at a macroeconomic level, uh, I was interested to read the HIA predicts that new homes, new home starts will fall below 100,000 for the first time in a decade. Uh, so we're not building enough new homes and really high interest rates are a big negative for the construction industry. It really does slow down construction, so it's not surprising. We've got population growth going nuts, uh, mainly driven by obviously increased immigration. Uh, Westpac estimates the immigration net immigration last year for 2022 reached a record 400,000 uh, people uh, and expects another 350,000 this calendar year. In addition to the, you know, around about 50,000 Chinese international students that are expected to land on our shores over the next couple of months. Uh, and then if you look at um, Australia economically, we're pre in pretty good shape. You know, the federal budget is expected to be in surplus this year, you know, really thanks to strong iron ore, gas and coal exports. Uh, so nothing of their own doing, but really, again, just the commodities uh, boom again. Unemployment is at historic lows, although the labour market does appear to be cooling a little bit. Um, but should we face any economic headwinds because of the higher interest rates, both the RBA and the federal government have plenty of options with respect to fiscal and monetary policy stimulus. So, you know, we're in a good position to sort of help our way through whatever economic pain the RBA is hell-bent on causing uh, in the pursuit of uh, lower inflation. So really, despite the volatility that we've experienced over the last six years, though, mentioned at the beginning of the episode, um, actually, property investment fundamentals are very, very strong. Now, finally, I wanted to finish by talking about the fixed rate mortgage cliff that uh, the the uh, media talks about regularly now. So, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about how many mortgages are going to switch from a fixed to a variable rate. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, the, the, the rates that people are going to pay might go from 2 to 6% or 2 to 5%. Whatever it is, it'll be a significant change. I don't think defaults rates will change much. Default and arrears rates will change. I think we'll see a small uptick, but I don't think um, we'll see a, a big change. Interestingly enough, last week in the RBA minutes, uh, they cited that Australia's excess pool of savings, so how much cash Aussies have saved uh, over the COVID period, is higher than almost anywhere else in the in, in the world. Um, and fixed rate borrowers have been well and truly warned. Like if you're sitting here today and you've got a fixed rate expiring this year, you've definitely thought already about how am I going to afford uh, and what changes do I need to make in order to afford it. Uh, interestingly enough, last week, uh, Westpac reported that around about 45% of its mortgage portfolio was tested at a benchmark interest rate equal to or lower than the current interest rate. And so what the media said then, or what the media read into that was, well, hang on, uh, if interest rates are higher than what these borrowers have been tested at, then maybe they're going to run into trouble. However, what they didn't put together is or didn't understand is that more than 75% of customers borrow less than what the banks will lend them. They don't borrow up to their maximum borrowing capacity. So they've still got uh, uh, some surplus cash flow to weather another two or three interest rate hikes. Look, I've been in this business for 20 years. Um, during that time, I've seen lots of commentary and rationale predicting that arrears rates and mortgage default rates are, are going to go through the roof and it's going to be a big problem. Um, during that time, we've had the cash rate getting as high as 7.25% in 2008. We had to navigate through a global financial crisis, a, a, massi a massive credit crunch. Um, we've had to deal with the supposed interest-only cliff where now the, the, the volume of interest-only loans has uh, has essentially halved over a very short period of time. 
Uh, and despite all these events over the last 20 years, uh, Australian mortgage rates have remained persistently low. And a big reason for that is that, firstly, we've got a well-regulated banking industry. You know, we don't have the same sort of cowboys that, you know, that created the GFC in the US. Uh, and then also, Australia is, Australia is very much the lucky country uh, when it comes to economic stability. Uh, and it won't be any different this time around. You know, we've got plenty of cash savings. Uh, we've got uh, good prudential regulation the banks are going to work with people that uh, are experiencing uh, a cash flow crunch. Uh, of course, there's going to be a small cohort of people that have got going to get themselves into trouble, but th- th- those people are always going to be there and it's always going to happen. In the main, this mortgage interest rate cliff, I think, is well and truly overcooked. And finally, to finish off, actually one last thing to finish off is just to, to, I guess, share an observation over the last couple of weeks. So feedback from clients and anecdotal evidence that I've witnessed in the market, it seems like sentiment may have changed over the last couple of weeks with respect to property. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, CoreLogic's daily home price index, so they release an index that, uh, that is based on real life data. Uh, it, it showed that prices stopped falling in uh, you know around mid to end of January, uh, which is interesting. I mean, it's only a small amount of data, so we can't read too much into it. Also, February tends to be a pretty buoyant month uh, because as you think about it, if you're a, a potential property buyer and you weren't successful last year, you've really had to wait through most of December and all of January to get your eyes on any new listings because most people don't start listing property until after Australia Day, so into into February. Uh, So it's true statistically that February is a little bit of a stronger month, so we can't read into it too much. Um, But I did do a episode in late uh, November last year that that stated all the reasons why I think we're close to the bottom in terms of property prices. uh, And my view certainly hasn't changed from then. So it'll be interesting to see what Um, property does this year. But on the whole, I think the long-term fundamentals uh, look very attractive. Uh, And it's also important to remind ourselves that it's far easier to buy property in a a market like it is today, where either prices are falling or stable, than it is when prices are rising uh, strongly. It's very difficult to operate in that market. Okay, again, apologies for a longer episode today, but until next week, bye for now.